back at Bay, Mike McCormick at this lunch, who has retired from Channel 2 in the meantime, Channel 2 and 9, uh, came up with the idea, why don't we bring up the students that are in the room, let them talk, and ask questions about the, from the pros in the room, uh, career-oriented uh, advice, that kind of thing. It proved to be very, very successful. People asked that we do it again. So uh, we are doing it again. We have three wonderful students. I'm going to ask all three of you to come up. You've met Marissa Dragos and Carly Ott of Pepperdine and Daniela Torres of Cal State Northridge, where I graduated from when it was Valley State, which was in the prehistoric times. And uh, they're all going to grab hand mics here. And so give us a second to get set. And uh, we'll let them ask questions of you for as much time as you feel it continues. And that'll be the end of the meeting, OK? Good to see all of you. Carly, Daniela, and Marissa. Come on up. So hi, everyone. My name is Daniela. I'm a student at Cal State Northridge. Um, and I am studying journalism, of course. And I've been focusing mainly like in print, but haven't really branched out to you know try out like for broadcast. Yeah, I try a little bit of magazine, but I wanted to ask if there is anyone here that transition transition from print to broadcast or from broadcast to print and why? Yeah, I worked at um, the Hollywood Citizen News, which was a, a newspaper back in uh, the fifties. And then I went to work for City News Service, which is a wire service in LA. And based on my, my uh, lucky years there, I got a job at NBC as a writer. So I was able to make the, the uh, change from uh, print journalism into broadcast. And there is a difference. And uh, print journalism, you've got to write a lot. And uh, broadcast journalism, you have to write to, uh, visually. So that's, that's really basically one of the differences. There's a lot, lot more involved, but I hope that answers some of your question. Thank you. Um, you, you can go now. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Marissa. Um, I visited in the, the April meeting, and I was just awed by all of your stories, and I'm so happy to be back. I'm a student at Pepperdine. I was actually a, a media production student, but I have been involved in our news waves on campus. We have a great journalism program, and I've just been in awe of everything I can do, especially these last couple days have been really tough. Um, but just going and seeing how much of a presence media has and being a part of that story and helping to tell that has been really important. So I'd love to hear kind of about an event that reminded you why you were in journalism. Hi, I'm not in journalism, but I'm just going to relate a story about my dad, Jack Fox, who was on that list. Uh, he, at the time, was working at the New York Post, and a guy came in to complain about how he worked. At, he was a, a soldier at Fort Dix, and everyone had to you know, do everything for this one guy, and it turned out that was the first step in taking down Joe McCarthy. And I think that was something my dad was always proud of, because this guy came in, complained, and walked out. My dad went out, grabbed him on the street, brought him back in, got more information, got the story, and it turned into history. And that was something he was always very proud of, and I think would answer your question as to uh, why he was a journalist. So don't let the little things get away from you. Right. you know, one little thing comes up, follow it, and uh, see where it leads. Just that transition from being a writer or a studio uh, being in the studio to covering more out in the field, especially breaking news. I'm just wondering if anyone, was, was that thrown upon you? Was that a choice you made? In a lot of the news business, it's not what you know, it's who you know. An awful lot of people in this business depend on people that you know and who you who you've met. Uh, there's probably a dozen people in this room that I have known for a long time. They're the kind of people I can go to and say, I'm looking for a job. And they'll say, oh, I heard Channel 13 is looking for a cameraman or something. Don't burn bridges behind you either. 
Uh, never badmouth people you work with. You may say, I never cared for so-and-so. But when you get to know people, get to know them. And, and uh, they may be your future boss. They may steer you to a, a good location to work. Hello, Brian Bland, AP Radio Retiree. Uh, I'll roll a couple of things together in, in several of the questions. As far as uh, working both sides of the street, being inside, being outside, broadcast, print, I've really had a great good fortune in working in just about all of those things. I've done magazine articles. Uh, I had broadcasting background, but when I first came to the AP, uh, I had also learned to write print style, and I was able to get a job partly by being recommended by an AP reporter in Carson City where I had worked in Reno and broadcasting. So it all, it all kind of runs together. And my impression of the way uh, journalism is going these days is that you need to be kind of everything in the same package. And you, of course, you will have specialized jobs, but in terms of covering the stories, my impression is you've got to be a videographer, a videographer as well as a writer, and uh, and that all rolls together. As far as motivation, I think uh, if you are interested in history and you have a chance to be not only reporting history as it's being made, but being part of history. And what I really mean by that is, especially in a market like this, if you're lucky enough to work in a large market, you're really going to be reporting and writing about issues that affect one way or the other pretty much the whole country, whether it's uh, the fires, uh, climate change. I mean, the list goes on and on. Personally, uh, and you may have the same preference, I never cared for the late night car crashes and all that kind of stuff. It, it just, it gets to be a kind of a continuum after a while. But covering a, a fire like the ones we're experiencing now, one of the effects that has when that news goes out is that people who are not affected by the disaster, their hearts do go out in many cases to the people who are affected. And then uh, in this modern world we live in, a lot of people hear about those stories now. It's not local at all. And then the money can pour in to help the people who've had a problem. And that's a very rewarding thing, that, that your reporting can be part of something like that. So uh, the profession's changing, but I would say broaden yourself and don't be afraid to change in mid-career. If there's something you think, you know what, I'd really like to, to be more print-oriented, or you know what, I'd really like to see about broadcast. Don't be afraid to change mid-career, late-career. I've done that several times, and I've, I had a ball my whole career. Thank you. For all three of you, there's probably three things you need to learn how to do. You need to learn how to write. You need to learn how to communicate simply, directly, linearly to talk to somebody, no matter who they are. You need a passion for information. Uh, and that has to be something that it's almost wired into you from the beginning. If you don't have that, change to accounting. And the other thing that I strongly, strongly uh, hope you have is uh, an innate curiosity to learn things. Uh, and you'll find through the years that uh, you'll have uh, a knowledge base that's probably uh, 55 miles wide and two inches deep but you'll have that 55 miles to draw on and you'll have the curiosity to make that one square mile over in the corner 50 miles deep if you need to. So learn how to write. That matters for anything you do. Learn how to write. Uh, and hopefully you're wired to have passion and you're wired to have an innate curiosity to learn. And people will tell you 
to major in this, to major in that. The one person that I learned the most from in my career was a bartender who left uh, being a bar, being a bartender who served people at <laughs> Eyewitness News. And she came to Eyewitness News and was a brilliant writer because she had the ability to listen, she had the ability to communicate, she had an innate curiosity, and she had a passion for people. I hope that's wired into your system, and if it is, then you'll have an enormous amount of success. Thank you. Um, um, based on all the things that are happening, breaking news-wise, as we're also mentioning the fires, have any of you been directly affected by a mass shooting or fires and had to report on it? And how, if you had to report on it, how did you deal with reporting on something, on something that touches so close to you, close to home? Um, like many people who have worked for a long time in this business, I did cover a fire. It was in Santa Barbara. Um, this is quite a few years ago. I can't say exactly when, but it was a big Santa Barbara fire. And I remember my, my bureau chief saying, we want you to go up there and maybe you can get a special story. Like maybe you can get up on the roof with some homeowner who's hosing down his house. And I said, I don't think so. Oh, I said, okay. And I went up there, and I could not get near the fire area. It was all blocked off. I waited until the next morning. And I went out, and I did a story on people coming to, to see whether their houses had survived and the anguish that they were going through. And while I was there, I noticed that you know, there were, most of the houses were gone. But there were birds singing. And that's what I wrote about because it was like a sign of hope in the middle of all this. And I said, you know, the birds came back to this neighborhood and so did the people. Um, but the song of the birds gave them some hope. Uh, there's always something you can find to write. I think that I was very impressed with your comments before about what you did when the shooting happened, because that is essential. The instinct of a reporter has to be to run to the scene of whatever is happening, or at least get on the phone and find out, and get the news out there. And sometimes it will be things that affect you personally. I've been in situations where I could have cried, you know, but instead of crying, I did a story. Um, I'm old enough to remember when President Kennedy was assassinated. And uh, we at my college were all very involved with him. He was very involved with youth, and we were doing all kinds of programs. Everybody loved him. When he died, I thought, what are we going to do? And I was editor of the school newspaper, and I walked around campus and grabbed a few of the people that worked on the paper. And I said, I have an idea. Come with me. And we got in my car. We went to the local newspaper and asked them if they needed help with anything. And we wound up working for the next 24 hours. Because even though we didn't live in the area where it happened, there were things to be done. You had to write about church services being planned and events being canceled and weddings being canceled, things that happened because of the assassination. And it gave us a feeling of doing something worthwhile. And I've always thought that that's part of journalism, is that you can feel that you are doing something important. You don't just sit there and watch the TV and see it unfold. You're part of it. Thank you. Um, along the lines of what Bill Wood was saying about the breadth of your experience and what Linda just talked about, about finding that the story you went for initially or were assigned to wasn't there and you couldn't get it. You had to shift gears. And it brings to mind uh, a story that happened when I was with KNBC, I was a day assignment editor, and Joe Ramirez, who was sitting about six people up here on the right, <clears throat> was a party to this, and this is what happened. It was in the wintertime, sometime in the 70s, 
uh, there were two or three teenage boys who got stranded in the snow overnight up at Fraser Park or in that area. And the LA County Sheriff's Department was going to send a helicopter in the next morning to bring them out. Uh, Joe and our, this was in the film day, so he had a two-man crew with him, uh, flew up there in our helicopter and they got to the scene and they landed and found that the sheriff's helicopter wouldn't start. Its oil pan was frozen or something. And so Channel 2, our big competitor, came along with their helicopter and went in and rescued the kids and brought them out. And Joe said, so basically we've been skunked. And I said, well, are the kids still there? And I said, yeah. He said, yeah. And I said, well, ask them if they'll go up in our bird and you can have them take you to where they were and show you where they spent the night stranded and then come back and you get your interviews. And it all happened that way. So always keep an eye open for what's the alternative here? What else can we do? We got skunked, all right, let's change directions and, and find another way to do the story. Keep that in mind. What I've heard, I mean, from Linda, from all the other veterans is, is, is such passionate truth that you guys have to understand. Um, You've got to go the further mile. You've got to, you've got to say, I have a, a, a nose for news and I'm going to get it. I, and as I think Linda said, uh, you, had, um, you, you showed passion when you were telling us about that story. That is what you need. And you need to go against, you know, sort of uh, bubble-headed editors who are worried about price. Um, you have to follow your dream. I, I, you know, there's so much that's been said that I was trying to encapsulate, but I'm not doing it too well. Um, they say that war correspondents, and this is wrong, the war correspondents have a death wish. That may be the case. But you almost need a war correspondent's passion and dedication to the job to be successful. Um, you're very young. Um, I like the way you talked about covering this story. Um, unfortunately, what happens very often was when you're covering a story, your adrenaline gets gets caught up, and I mean, your adrenaline did get catch up, caught up with you, and you, and it did become overpowering. Um, but but follow what you instinctively know is 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 a good story, no matter what an editor says. I mean, I could tell you other stories. We don't have the time. We've had a long, wonderful, wonderful afternoon with just a diversity of great stories and tales and stuff like that. But all I'm going to say is good luck, follow your dream and keep that passion. This goes off of the mass shootings and the fires and just everything you've said about going out and reporting. What are some safety protocols that I probably haven't heard in my journalism class about what you do when you're reporting on a fire, what you're supposed, if there's anything um, that you're supposed to be using and paying attention to specifically that LA Fire Department may be mentioning, if there are different protocols mandatory evac evacuation wise, because of course there's NBC, ABC, we're all out there. Um, and then we've got the helicopters, which I know that you have been involved in, um, or, but just what are the protocols that journalists follow that are different than a civilian? Uh, my name is Jim. One recommendation I would have for you is keep a third eye out for the police and keep it out for the fire department. When they move, you move. Don't be caught in a riot situation where the police move back suddenly and you're stuck there. Don't be caught in a fire situation where they pull back and you're caught there. 409 of the penal code says police got to let you in where, where other the public can't go. And you have a right to be there at your own peril. But you don't want to get caught in one of those situations. And that would be my, my, my big tip right there. And something like the North Hollywood shooting uh, that was, happened here several years ago. I was, I was there at that time. Uh, get in a position, stay there, and do whatever you can do. Shoot what you can shoot from there. Get whatever information you can get from there, but be very, very careful because your life is, is just as much in peril as anyone else. Always remember safety. And one, and one last thing I gotta say. There was a guy um, who did a, a demonstration, and everybody thought he was kind of crazy, uh, and he had a backpack. He was a reporter. He put his backpack up on the table, and he pulled out goggles. He pulled out a fire jacket. He pulled out sneakers. He pulled out uh, 
you know, uh, power bars. He pulled out every single thing in that backpack. That was Pete Demetrio. <laughs> People have probably seen his, uh, yeah, everybody kind of thought he was funny, but I've got a backpack in my car and uh, you should have one in your car. Have comfortable shoes, have fire goggles, have all the things that you're going to need to do your job because like so many people have said here, you never know when you're going to get called off of a news conference to go cover a fire or uh, you know, maybe a, a disaster of some sort. Always be prepared. Thank you. Yeah. A good friend of mine uh, once said, you want to report the story and not become the story. So that's really what we're saying. Just mind yourself, watch your back. And as he said, when, when the fire and police pull out, make sure you keep an eye on them and depend on your co, co, co workers. Um, many times when you're out in the field, um, you might not get there on time, you might not be right spot on the scene, but your co workers and your, your other comrades, you can depend on them to give you some help and look to them for guidance. I want to add something. You mentioned safety. Uh, you also need to develop, um, I call it a, an ability, an urban ability to just know where you are and what's around you. Uh, you can't blithely go into some neighborhoods without being aware of what's going on. Listen to footsteps. If you're walking along with the crew and you suddenly hear a third set of footprints behind you, look and see what that is. Uh, and the, finally, the by knowing what's going on in an urban reality, I was producing a, a, a coverage of riots and while the reporter was doing his stand-up, uh, a gang member appeared in the background in the shadows and started flashing gang signs. And you know, I told the reporter in his ear, get out of there now. And, um, but you have to know what the person's doing back there. And just be aware, you're in an urban environment generally, be aware of what's going on around you. Thank you. Carly, Marissa, and Daniela, thank you very much for being here. And thank you to all of you who provided experience from years and years in the career. Uh, so much of it was so well said. Thank you for contributing. And again, especially to the two students that are here from Pepperdine, Marissa and Carly, uh, congratulations on the job that you and your fellow student journalists have done over the past three, four days. Um, it's a life learning experience like no other. Uh, we weren't lucky to have this happen, but we were lucky for you to learn from it so you become the people who bring us the stories in the years to come. Thank you. I want to tell you about the lunches that are coming up in 2019, and they are here. Uh, the next one we've told you about is the Eyewitness News celebration of 50 years of the format on Saturday, February 2nd, and there will be other lunches on May 4th, August 3rd, and November the 2nd. That's all in 2019. Eyewitness News at 50, February 2nd. If you have friends who either work now or previously for Channel 7 here, who don't know about this, please pass the word. Again, our website is newsgeezers.com. And finally, the people in the back would like you to know that please return your name tags outside to Gary and John when you leave. And the very last piece of business is uh, to wish you all a very happy holiday and a joyful and prosperous and healthy 2019. Despite what went on here in Los Angeles the past three or four days, I'm gratified that so many people were able to make it here today. It means a great deal. I thank you all, and I wish you a safe drive home.